so let's sum up uh, what we learned uh, last time. Uh, we said there have been basically several concepts which are important, plus uh, a number of technical details. Uh, the main concept uh, which I think is important uh, is uh, the concept of the degenerate operator. We, we said that uh, if we have a certain operator with dimension delta, then uh, we can form a descendant And this descendant uh, is uh, actually uh, could be set to zero, provided that uh, it is both a secondary and primary operator, uh, which means, uh, well, by definition, it is a descendant operator, secondary operator, but uh, uh, we impose two conditions. This is satisfied and fixes delta. And the second condition fixed, uh, uh, it dependent on C, it actually gives us certain delta as a function of C. Uh, only then it is satisfied. And we call such operator, uh, such phi operator, we call it phi 105 or psi 12. Uh, meaning 12 indices uh, means that uh, Generally speaking, Nm index means that at the level Nm uh, we have a null state. This is another name for this, is the null state. And um, the, it's the fact related, it's purely algebraic fact of uh, the Virasora algebra, uh, which says that uh, such uh, degeneracies do exist, and they exist on the level. By level, I mean how much you raise uh, the dimension of phi. Here you raise it by two. Um, um, and um, algebraic, the algebraic fact related not to any field theory, but just to the structure of the algebra, is that uh, it happens at the level Nm, and there is a set of operator phi and m with dimension delta and m of c. And we wrote down last time the formula, uh, which is something like c minus 1 divided by 24. It's, it's a pure algebraic exercise to find it. Plus 1 quarter of alpha plus n plus alpha minus n. Um, and these uh, degenerate operators, they actually play the basic role in CFT. Um, they determine, um, so to say, the skeleton of CFT. And then you put some meat on the, over this skeleton. Um, we, the, the, what was not quite satisfactory, and I... Uh, keep thinking that it should be uh, should be done, but it was never done. Uh, well, the geometrical mean, I, I, I mentioned it briefly last time, I shall mention it as an open problem uh, once again. What does that mean geometrically uh, that uh, this is a null vector? Remember we learned that if we have conformal field theory on a disk, then uh, the correlation functions are invariant uh, under um, deformation L minus 1. So uh, you have the algebra, the SL2R algebra uh, of deformations, and as usual the vacuum state is annihilated by L1 and L0. But it is also what is unusual, that that's tr would be true for any primary. Uh, what is unusual is that it is also invariant under L minus 1. And we related this fact 
to the statement that uh, this Möbius transformation is uh, mm, is uh, preserving the disk. So correlation functions on the disk are the same. Um, now, uh, the open question is this. Um, we have also operators L minus 2, L minus 3, and so on, and their combinations. And we uh, already learned that the vacuum is, generally speaking, not invariant uh, under um, these transformations. And this can be interpreted as uh, saying that uh, this, uh, it creates kind of a goldstone bosons, this operation with the vacuum. And it can be interpreted as uh, saying that um, this more general conformal transformation, they transform the disk into something, some domain. And the, this is, let's suppose that this is a conformal map f of c. And uh, the statement is that if we have uh, some uh, some um, correlation function on a disk, then uh, it is equal to f prime of z1 to the power delta 1, f prime of zn to the power delta n, and here we have phi C1, phi of f of C2, etc., calculated on the different region gamma. So I'm just making a little more precise uh, what I already told you before uh, several times that it would be impossible to, to, to find a function of n variables which will be equal, which will be unchanged under this transformation. This uh, will be t totally empty uh, uh, correlation function. Now, so if we try to put uh, d here instead of gamma, uh, then uh, we would get, uh, as I said, uh, the only possible f would be Möbius transformation, which transformed disk onto the disk, and that corresponds to this statement. Uh, but uh, uh, the fact that the vacuum is deformed, the, the region is deformed, uh, allows you to relate correlation function before conformal transformation and after. That's so much I told you already. Uh, now, and, excuse me, to complete the statement, uh, we also have, uh, we understand that infinitesimally L minus 2 uh, can be interpreted as some variation, uh, some small variation of the domain. And here I'm starting, uh, so far it's, all these are well-established facts, uh, and now I'm uh, formulating a kind of a conjecture. Uh, so, um, the L minus two, f first of all, we can find uh, what kind of deformation is L minus two and relate the correlation function. But then uh, we would, uh, how would you formulate the, on this geometrical language, um, the statement that this is zero. What uh, do you th I, I don't really know for certain the answer myself to this, uh, but there is a natural conjecture you can make, uh, namely uh, that there are Certain, conform, certain discrete set of conformal transformations, which somehow, although they change the domain, they don't change the correlation function. And uh, that 
should be related to some uh, integral of motion in the system. Um, it sounds uh, vague, and it is uh, vague, because, um, as I said, it's not... Mm, somehow it never been... Uh, I tried from time to time to uh, find something constructive from this, but... Uh, but even if there is nothing uh, constructive, it's interesting. It's interesting to, it would be a better understanding. So generally speaking, the problem is to better understand this deformation leading to the null vectors. Uh, uh, to finish with it, so what I'm saying is, uh, higher there are solar generators, um, they generate the change of the domain. Uh, null vectors are such uh, combinations um, of um, of uh, of the uh, secondary operators, which, although they change the domain, they don't change the correlation function. So that's something uh, uh, I suggest you think about it. All right, uh, but that that well, that's a digression. It's certainly not what I'm. Um, uh, planning to talk about. Um, now we also, last time we also uh, introduced we, we, introdu we parameterized the dimension by c minus 1 divided by 24. We, we did several useful parameterizations of the dimensions. That was one of them and uh, the psi 1, 2 acts on the operator phi alpha as phi alpha minus alpha minus alpha plus alpha plus. And uh, the meaning of, of this symbolic relation is that uh, that, by the way, was derived from the differential equation, which I will not repeat. We wrote it down last time. Um, uh, the meaning of it is that because of these degenerate operators, um, because of these null states, uh, we have, when you have a, an operator with certain dimension in the, in the theory, you are bound to have also the dimensions defined by alpha plus alpha plus and alpha plus alpha minus. Um, so, and using this thing, you can actually also derive the rule that it would be phi nm plus 1 plus phi nm minus 1. So it tells you how other degenerate operators uh, are related, all related to each other. So that already tells you that you will have a huge proliferation of... Uh, various operators if for, for the generic values of C and delta. And probably, although it's never been proved, it's very, it might become inconsistent because of this uh, growth uh, of uh, both all possible dimensions in the theory. And uh, there is, however, there are, however, some exceptions. Uh, to this, uh, and the exception is that after certain, uh, when you apply psi one two certain number of times, you return to the same operators. So how can it happen? We, for that, uh, we introduced another parameterization, and we will um, now use this. Um, namely, we said that let's uh, write down another. Uh, parameterization of this equation is this. Uh, let's write down delta Rs, the dimension of the operator which is degenerate on the level Rs, in this form. Uh, I actually, you see, to it's an elementary exercise to, to check all these uh, different, that all these different parameterizations are equivalent to each other. Um, 
It's just the, when uh, you start working with straightforwardly with these equations, you find that it's much easier to use this variable, not delta. But it's not something very fundamental. Uh, so you have you introduce two numbers, and um, uh, the uh, central charge is one plus minus six p minus p prime square divided by p p prime. Um, they are related. This p and p prime are related, something like that. It's p divided by p prime and alpha minus is p prime divided by p. Six is yes. a numerator, right? Uh, let me see. Uh, no, uh, I guess, uh, let me remember and see whether what it is. But the simplest way to check it, the simplest way to check it uh, is to look at the Ising model. Uh, the Ising model corresponds, as we will see in a moment, it's p equals 3, p prime equals 4. Uh, so you have 112 uh, and c is equal to 1 half. So uh, that's what, uh, what it should be. Mm. Uh, but it would be a good idea for you to check all the numbers which I'm writing on the blackboard. There could be some uh, typos there. Um, uh, and it will be very useful for you to get the feeling of this. Uh, so one exercise is just uh, to directly verify the formula for, for delta, for delta of C, by solving these two equations. Um, if you are especially enthusiastic, you can go to the level 3. Uh, at level 4, I'm afraid there will be no, uh, no taker of this problem. Uh, but you will notice some, uh, actually, how this general formula was derived. It's just uh, you notice that uh, uh, things are repeating themselves. Uh, there are some proofs of this formula for general N and M, but um, in fact you get uh, the idea on the starting with the level 1, 2, or level 2 or level 3. Uh, so on the level 3 it would be something like L minus 3 plus B L minus 1 square L minus 2 plus C L minus 3 minus 1 to the cube. And you have to kick it with this L1 and L2. Um, um, okay, um, now Mm. Mm. Uh, and now to uh, finish with it, uh, you, you, the, the basic feature of this formula is that uh, if p and p prime are integers, then uh, if they are not integers, then uh, you have infinite number of all possible dimensions. But if they are integers, <clears throat> then delta Rs, delta Rs, as you see from here, is equal to delta P minus R, P prime minus S. So, uh, as you increase R and S, you don't get the new operators. And you can postulate, it would be consistent to postulate that Psi Rs which is of course possible only for, in, for the integers, otherwise it's not working. Um, and that means that the number of primaries is finite because it simply means that the number of primary, primaries will be uh, P minus 1, P prime minus 1 actually one half over this because of some other symmetries, uh, permutation symmetries. Uh, and in any case, you see that it's consistent to think of these degenerate operators uh, um, about the theories with finite number of uh, primary operators. Um, and that's what is called the minimal model, um, PP prime. 
then uh, people prove that uh, from positivity and from uh, unitarity, we, we discuss this, that unitarity tells you that C cannot be zero and C must be positive, but there is even stronger constraint if you calculate the two-point functions of this operator, uh, that unitarity exists only when P prime is equal to P plus one. Um, and indeed there are minimal models uh, with this thing. The uh, first thing you find out is that the model M34 is the Ising model. Uh, how you find this out? You simply take in a very straightforward way. You, mm, uh, the, uh, the first step is straightforward. You calculate all anomalous dimensions, delta 1, 2, delta 2, 1, and then they coincide with the exact solution of the Ising model. So in this sense, you don't prove. Uh, you just observe that uh, the known exact solution gives the same uh, anomalous dimension as, uh, as this uh, formula for degenerate operators. And it was quite a surprise, actually, it was not expected. Mm. Uh, now, mm. and for, as you go to more complicated uh, lattice models, mm. I will tell you something about it now, uh, you still get uh, the result that uh, m most of statistical models, uh, they are uh, this or that, minimal model of conformal field theory. In the Ising model, uh, you have um, you have operators, uh, the unit operator with delta equals zero, you have uh, the spin operator, and you have energy density operator. Uh, there are only three operators, meaning that when you and they satisfy by the way that's also important they satisfy the rule that if epsilon epsilon if you take uh, the product of two epsilons then it is a unit uh, this notation means that it is a unit operator and its descendants meaning that there will be only energy momentum tensor appearing here and it's higher Mm, descendants. Uh, sigma sigma is epsilon and sigma epsilon is sigma. Now um, that's important. Uh, how you derive these things first in the first place? You derive these things uh, by uh, looking at uh, the differential equations uh, satisfied and by looking, where is this formula? Where is it? It's basically looking at this formula. Uh, then you, you find that certain operators don't appear and you check it with differential equations. So there's a lot of work which I will not go into. Uh, but you can since you have concrete differential equations, you can basically calculate anything with these uh, uh, operators. And then, uh, and then you can add an argument, which I alluded to several times already, uh, that you can derive the equation of motion for the Ising model by, by using operator product expansion. Uh, indeed, you see that uh, from these rules, I am erasing this uh, a geometrical meaning of, of the secondaries. If you come with some ideas, I would be very interested to, to listen. Um, uh, so, uh, we find that, uh, and by the way, 
epsilon is psi 1, 2, sigma is psi 2, 1, and unit operator is psi 1, 1. Uh, how you derive it, how you identify this in a very uh, primitive way, you simply take this formula and you take the known uh, variables of uh, the, the known anomalous dimensions of the Ising model, and they 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 are the same. Um, so, uh, uh, how you the the argument, uh, the other representation of the Ising model, which we discussed uh, many times already, is as a phi-four theory where phi is proportional to the spin sigma. So we should somehow uh, define uh, the equations of motion in phi for theory at this one. Laplacian of, of phi is equal to phi cube. Uh, how they are related to, this, to these things? As we discussed several times, we, we have if we take a product of three sigma, let's assume, how shall, we, how shall I put it, let's assume that we take the product, uh, we take some uh, infinitesimal displacement because the product at the same point is singular. Uh, and we call, let's call it sigma to the cube. And uh, using our, our fusion rules, we see that it is equal to the conformal class of sigma. And now I want to identify it with this, with this thing. That's, uh, that's a, you see, I'm telling you this because it's a very, uh, important method. Uh, what? Uh, how is it obvious that sigma cube is, is, is sig the descendant? Oh, of oh okay. Um, uh, well, it's it is uh, this formula. Probably you can see. It. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I see, but, uh, uh, so you have s uh, product of two sigma. Uh, okay, yeah. uh, it gives conformal class of epsilon, a, a product of three sigma, uh, because of this uh, gives you conformal class of sigma. Now the meaning, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, this symbolic formula, uh, they mean uh, that you take two operators at close by points, start expanding, and then what will appear in the right hand side is uh, sigma and its descendants, all possible descendants of sigma. That's what, but uh, we still have some question how to get this, where this Laplacian comes from. There's also a question, um, there's also a question, the sigma begins with uh, operator itself. Uh, and it certainly not, doesn't look like that. So we have a puzzle on our, on our hands. Um, the, if we add this, we have conformal class of sigma contains sigma plus L minus case. Well, let's write it down this way. I will write it down as L minus one, L minus one bar sigma uh, plus higher operators. Um, now I dropped, I, I, I actually drop uh, the things like that uh, because uh, when I average uh, b because this operator is not uh, rotationally invariant. So when I average, when I use this, um, this product, one assumes in quantum, that's 
some, some, something general from quantum field theory that when you, you introduce point splitting, again, when I'm say, saying quantum field theory, think of, say, quantum electrodynamics as the simplest thing, or young mill theory. You introduce the point splitting, but you have, which is equivalent to introducing the cutoff. But this cutoff, we assume in quantum electrodynamics uh, that um, this cutoff is isotropic. It doesn't break um, rotational symmetry or Lorentz symmetry. Uh, otherwise, we will have many nasty uh, divergences. When you discuss renormalizability of QED, it is always assumed that you average overall direction, this point splitting. Uh, for instance, uh, when you have electron mass generated by, by this diagram, um, it is... Uh, mm, uh, what would be the, how it, it will, it's a divergent diagram and uh, we have d for k, k square for the photon and p minus k for, for, for the electron. So what kind of divergence it gives us? Naively linear, but uh, why it is not? Li in fact, it is logarithmic only, um, and which can be interpreted, by the way, in a very simple way. If you have classical uh, uh, electron uh, of the radius a, then the, its Coulomb energy will be of the order of e square divided by a. Uh, now, what would you expect and why in quantum theory? Yes, uh, but why is that? Uh, yeah, because the, we have uh, uh, uncertainty principle which tells us that um, the minimal, uh, if we have uh, uh, if we have the momentum of the order of m, then it means that the thing are uh, fuzzy and smoothed uh, around on the Compton radius uh, with a of the order of m. Uh, so delta m, it's delta m coming from electromagnetic field, is expected to be m e square. In fact, it's not that, that uh, good because it's actually multiplied by the logarithm of the number, there are many modes of the photon, and so there is also the logarithm of the cutoff. But there is no linear divergence here, which naively comes from here. And linear divergence is cancelled uh, by the averaging over angles. So linear divergence is not there, provided that uh, our cutoff is uh, rotationally symmetric. That's uh, the reminder. Here also we should be averaging, we should do the point splitting in a symmetric way. Um, concrete way doesn't matter. Uh, that eliminates, uh, that leaves us only with these operators in the lowest order. And now we have to, the only pro L minus 1, L minus 1 bar is the Laplacian. So everything is fine with it. But what to do with sigma? What do you think is the origin of this extra sigma term and uh, what should we, how should we uh, get around this? Remember, I will, we have to write down the Lagrangian, the bare Lagrangian, and we have to adjust it to the critical point. We said the mass is zero, so that goes. Yes, exactly. The point is that we have, generally speaking, uh, we should write the equation m0 square phi 
and M0 should be tended to M0 critical. Only then uh, uh, that uh, uh, at this critical value uh, things should, uh, should be consistent. And indeed this is just this, the KV, we will obtain, if we take three sigmas, we will obtain the sigma term, but the coefficient in front of it is just the um, just the bare mass which is fixed by the condition uh, of criticality. Uh, so uh, we, I, I, you can also say that you fine-tune um, these uh, coefficients so that um, uh, so that uh, the this term will will be eliminated, so that physical mass is zero. So this term is indeed is coefficient in front as a physical mass, which should be set to zero. And this way of thinking, now, uh, so in the Ising model, of course, it's, it doesn't give you much new. It's you already we already know it from the other. But let's think a little bit about. Uh, uh, we have M34. Let's uh, go to the model M45, the next model. Uh, there are many up. I shall. There are much more operators there. Um, this uh, this four. This is the number of operators uh, in M34. Let's check ourselves. Uh, we have three operators in M45. Um, we will have uh, three, four divided by two. We'll have six, six uh, primary operators. And this thing will not work. Uh, if you take three sigma, you will not get simply conformal class of sigma, but you will get conformal class of other operators. However, um, you have uh, uh, you have um, uh, if you take the product of uh, five sigma uh, that I, I will leave you for the homework this rule fusion rules for that there are for the separators and uh, in you can. Uh, uh, look at the paper uh, papers which discuss this model, and um, this sigma to the five uh, operator will contain the conformal class of sigma. Just trust me on that. Uh, that if you do things carefully, this will be replaced by this thing. And um, now. Uh, uh, now try to identify the, what, what does that mean, how, which, which statistical system we are describing now. Just think of uh, completely analogous uh, procedure, mm, but with this fusion, uh, the, the, with this uh, algebra. Try to guess the field theory. Yeah, guess the field theory. Uh, uh, always do first what is easy. <laughs> uh, so it's it's right. Uh, so we have the uh, if we again drop this thing, uh, the max. It will be better to say it will be d square phi. It will be um, uh, phi uh, to the fifth power plus uh, various lower components of this, um, and uh, so the Landau free energy in the in the Ising. I remind you the and uh, it was gradient of phi square plus phi to the fourth. Here is a uh, gradient of phi square plus five to the sixth. Uh, 
now remember the land of the the land of philosophy. What to, what does that mean that when we start with such a uh, yes, uh, in fact, it means the following, that uh, you, you do have here C1 phi to the fourth, you want to preserve the C2 symmetry, plus uh, C2 phi square. And uh, in here we also have some C1 phi square term generally speaking. And we said that critical point is defined by C1 equal to zero. The, those phenomenological coefficients, they depend on temperature, pressure, and other physical, uh, physical data. Uh, so uh, in the Ising model, we simply set uh, C1 to zero. That's one condition that fixes the transition temperature. Uh, for this. Here, to get phi to the 6, you have to fix two parameters to zero. So this is, um, uh, you need some model in which you have two independent parameters, like temperature and pressure, for example. Um, here it is, um, and th this mo the model in question is called the tree critical, uh, this is such points are called tree critical points, and it's a tree criticalizing model. You can get it in many ways. Uh, for example, you can set uh, the energy you know, sigma v x x prime sigma x sigma x prime plus lambda sum of sigma x square, where uh, sigma x is plus minus one and zero. If you allow extra uh, zero, you will get uh, this. Um, and there, is, there are many other ways of getting to this critical point, tree critical point. In any case, it's a tree, tree, tree critical uh, in uh, more physic in uh, real life. A tree critical point in, you encounter with them when you have critical mixtures. Then you have concentration, temperature, and pressure and uh, you can adjust several parameters um, uh, at which uh, the model will become critical. So uh, this model M45 indeed describes uh, the tree criticalizing model, but the surprises don't end there. There is a quite a, uh, the reason I'm taking, spending some time talking about it is that um, it actually, um, it actually has um, something very, very surprising inside. So, um, yes, please. So how come, if you're only just tuning one extra parameter to zero, how can your number of primary operators increase? I guess if you compare oh. m. Oh, what? Well, yeah, but uh, uh, roughly speaking, well, mm, uh, the formal answer is that it's a very general, a very different things. So, uh, you you are saying that these parameters are not present in the actions, and in a sense, are not constrained; they are free to appear. Mm. Uh, but, uh, well, f the formal answer is that uh, the number of primary operators and uh, the number of these uh, uh, vanishing terms, they are different. They are not really the same thing. You may ask of some, for some intuitive explanation why mm -hmm. setting this term to zero increased the number of primary operators? That's a very good question. And I can say I have a good answer but, uh, to this. Uh, but roughly speaking, um, it is that uh, when, when this term is present, uh, then the action suppresses large fluctuation of phi to the four, because you have e to the minus s, and when you calculate phi to the four, then it is uh, suppressed by such a term. When you make it critical, 
uh, you open the door for more types of fluctuations. It's not a very good answer, but uh, well, the, the, you can try to find more intuitive answer to this. Um, but generally, it's, well, the the precise thing which can be said is that you shouldn't identify the number of uh, it's, it's it's just different, uh, just apples and oranges. Um, Still, it's a good question, it's worth thinking. Maybe you, after some thinking, you will find uh, a good answer to this question, a in good intuitive answer. My guess would be that it is related to the suppression of uh, phi to the 4 fluctuation in the ordinary model and its release in the, um, in the tree critical model. Um, now, the, this tree critical model, it has completely different critical exponents. Moreover, uh, it has different uh, critical dimension even. Uh, remember, we, when we talked about the Isaac model, uh, we said that the critical dimension is 4. Now I, I want you, that's an easy question. Uh, it's an easy home exercise. Uh, what is the critical dimension for the tree criticalizing model at which uh, I remind you the critical dimension was the dimension after which the theory becomes free essentially and um, it's easy to to find uh, so they are quite different and of course this uh, formula gives you quite different answers for deltas but if you look at this formula you will find something very surprising. You will find that there is a, in the Ising model, uh, there is the, uh, the operator Psi 1, 2 has dimension 1 half. And this is uh, the free fermions, Psi upset. The epsilon, uh, which we introduce here, is the product of left and right fermions or psi bar psi. Mm. But you can also consider the chiral part of the algebra which consists only of the left fermions and the rules for these fermions is that psi psi is a unit operator which means that a psi of z, psi of zero uh, is one or z multiplied by unit operator uh, plus uh, terms which um, w which will be non-singular um, in z, non-singular terms. For example, let me ask you, uh, what's the next term in this expansion? Uh, what would be the next term? If it, it should be a conformal class of, of the unit operator, what is the next non-trivial uh, operator in this conformal class? Stress energy tensor? Yes, and uh, it is stress energy tensor, exactly. And uh, what, what will be the power of Z in front? Huh? Plus one. Sorry? Z plus one. Yes, z plus one. That's why it is on C. It, it must be odd because of, of statistics of psi. And it is non singular. So that's, that's the situation in the Ising. And let's compare it with the situation with the tree critical Ising. Uh, Using this formula for dimensions, you will find that there is a, an operator, let's call it S of C, analogous in a sense to this psi, uh, which has dimension three halves. As a result, uh, 
when you take s of z, s of zero, you get some coefficient divided by z to the cube plus uh, another coefficient divided by z, t of z. That's the structure plus non-singular terms. Uh, by the way, I shall mention in the passing, in passing that uh, uh, when you know all singular terms, it's usually sufficient to reconstruct the whole, if you have correlation function, which has these singularities, you don't have to know explicitly these non-singular terms. You can reconstruct it from the singularities by... Uh, using the properties of meromorphic functions. You reconstruct the, for example, you can derive the weak theorem and uh, for, a, for the endpoint functions of these fermions. But that's not what I'm interested in. Now I want you to uh, see, to try to see what, what will happen here if we go to Minkowski and calculate the correlation function. So we have S of X, uh, x plus s of zero, and we want to calculate the uh, correlation function, the commutator of these guys. Uh, let's. It's, it turns out to be easy. Let's put it t of zero. Uh, uh, it is um, actually easier to start with this term. So we discussed it several times in Minkowski space. Uh, what is 1 over z? Y yes, it's 1 over x plus minus i epsilon sine x minus. And uh, the commutator is, uh, to obtain the commutator, we have, uh, so the, we have, we, we have a branch point uh, here and we have the position x minus. So the commutator will be simply sine of x minus delta of x plus. Um, and you have to, that, that's the, the, the discontinuity. Well, it's important, so let me make, uh, make it clear, although. Uh, this, uh, what, what I'm planning to do now is I'm planning to establish a certain operator algebra satisfied by those operators. And um, in the first place, I will put the plus here. Well, let, I think I was, uh, it, 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 I understand now it deserves better explanation because it's quite a fascinating thing. Let's start with fermion, with Ising fermions. Uh, what will be canonical commutators which follow from this. Let me ask you this way. So you have this separator product and we want to establish canonical commutators. No, not canonical, commutation relations. So we want to know what is anti, what would be the anti-commutator x plus x minus psi zero zero Uh, how to approach this thing. Uh, let's, let's talk about it a little bit. For you to keep interested, let me uh, explain my goal. I'm going to return and to see the commutators of this fermionic field. And we will find, not surprisingly, that these are free fermions and we will find canonical commutators here. No surprises in the rising case. Then we uh, 
make the same procedure, we follow the same procedure in the tree critical case. And what we will find will be supersymmetry. So the answer I am driving at is that, is that this tree criticalizing mode T-critical magnet, you just approach, have some magnet, you approach to the T-critical point, and suddenly you discover that there is supersymmetry in this system, which is quite fascinating. Supersymmetry is the uh, transformations which are, which anti-commute instead of commuting, mm. of the Lie algebra with anti-commutators. Uh, so, uh, and to achieve this goal, to, to, to see this, I begin with this. Uh, uh, and l let's remember, uh, so it's one or x plus uh, minus i epsilon sine x plus sine x minus. And uh, l remember that um, we have it's a psi plus psi plus fermions. So the d minus psi plus, when we apply it here, we, um, we apply d minus uh, psi plus psi plus. This is equal to d minus applied to one or uh, principal value one or x plus plus i pi sine x minus delta of x plus uh, and uh, you see that we get uh, delta of x, i pi delta of x plus delta of x minus so it's indeed, we are checking that this is indeed the green function. Uh, and this is the green function, this is the Feynman green function, uh, which is also easy to, to see. Um, okay, now we define the T product of x plus x minus. Uh, by saying that for uh, uh, we have for x minus it is psi of x plus psi of zero for x minus greater than zero and it's psi of minus psi of zero psi x minus for x minus less than zero. Uh, x plus. So uh, the order x minus here plays the role of time, or it's an ordering variable, and uh, this t product on it uh, gives you this, uh, and from this you can find uh, uh, you can find uh, from this formula uh, we now uh, can find the anti-commutator for that. How we find the anti-commutator? Uh, we simply uh, take uh, the expression with x minus. We see that psi of x plus psi of zero is equal to uh, one over x plus minus i epsilon uh, psi of x mi uh, of zero psi of x plus is equal to minus and uh, not surprisingly uh, you get uh, the when you uh, use this uh, you get uh, the um, answer uh, that psi of x plus psi of x minus psi of zero anti-commutator uh, is, is proportional to delta of uh, delta of x plus. Um, and that's the canonical 
uh, commutators for fermions, nothing surprising. Indeed, dimension is, uh, it should be expected on the basis of their normal dimensions. Dimension is one half, so that function has dimension one. Okay, so there is no, no uh, the only, uh, my only uh, goal in this exercise uh, was to show you how this one or z coefficient in the Euclidean uh, in the Euclidean region transforms into this canonical commutator. I was uh, before telling you that canonical commutators don't make sense in general, and they don't. But here we have free fields; we have no interaction, and that's why we reproduced. We have normal dimensions, uh, so no surprises here. Now. Uh, now we, we go uh, to the tree criticalizing model, and here the fun begins. Um, first of all, uh, let's translate this term. Uh, th this term. Let's, uh, let's now calculate the commutator, and uh, what we will get from the B term. So, uh, the, the lesson here was that uh, the pole, simple pole, correspond to the delta function in the, uh, the anti-commutator. So, uh, here we have a simple pole. So, what, how, how would you interpret this? Yes, it's simply delta of x plus multiplied by t. Uh, and now we have uh, the other term, uh, uh, which we called a, and that's easy to figure out what it is. So what, what it will be? Uh, it will be actually, yes, uh, it will be uh, so um, the, uh, the, if you if we integrate now the if we introduce the charges, Uh, we have, uh, well, we cannot write down as S of C dz, the conserved charge, uh, which is anti-commuting, and the momentum is, which is integral uh, T of Z dz. Uh, it actually has an, a subscript plus, but it's plus one half, and this is also have plus. Uh, but with uh, spin one, we get the relation that uh, q plus uh, square is equal to p plus, q minus square would be analogously equal to p minus, and plus and minuses are totally independent, so the, their anti-commutator is equal to zero. Uh, this is uh, what is the simplest example of what is called supersymmetry. Um, more general, in four dimensions, supersymmetry is described by the spinners, like, like here, because uh, Q transforms as spin one half. So in 4D, uh, we have the commutator of two Q, and it's equal to gamma matrix multiplied by p mu with indices alpha and beta. And that's uh, just this relation written in concrete coordinates. Uh, the kind of a miracle here is uh, the reason for this discussion is that uh, uh, supersymmetry can appear from nowhere. It's just the property, 
it's amazing this, this was just a property of uh, this formula for anomalous dimensions which dictated that for the tree critical I think we get the spin three half operator. Uh, and um, that's uh, quite surprising. We don't know uh, whether supersymmetry exists uh, in elementary particle physics. So far, the LHC didn't discover it. Maybe it will, maybe it will not, but uh, it certainly is there in these magnetic systems. <clears throat> yeah, well, it's, I, I was a bit uh, going a bit too fast here because uh, because we are going slow to slow. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, we have the let, let's begin with the momentum. We have momentum. We have t plus plus. X plus uh, plays the role of spatial coordinate. Uh, and uh, you also can define angular momentum in the same way. So one way, or oh, that's just the standard, uh, the, it's the light cone version of the following. Suppose you have energy momentum T0,0, which depends on X and T. Then the energy, it's energy density. The energy is obtained by integrating over x. Yeah. And any, if you have electric charge, it's the current integrated over x. Now, in the light cone cordon, you can uh, actually change, uh, go to the light cone coordinates, and uh, in this case, you will have the momentum P plus, which will be integrated over variable X plus. So X plus will play the role of the spatial coordinate. And X minus is, is time, and in, indeed D minus P plus will be zero, of course. So it's time independent conserved momentum. And have we looked at the tri critical model? in D equals 2 as well? Well, it is, uh, I, I, uh, I, I thought I said this, that uh, it is D equals 2, of course. Supersymmetry appears only when I use this uh, D equals 2 formula. No one knows what happens in D equals 3. Uh, so, um, it's only, it's a, so far, it's just a two-dimensional phenomenon spontaneous appearance of supersymmetry. You may ask uh, what will happen if you go to the higher, higher models, uh, what, what will happen then? And uh, it was analyzed, and there is a, in the next model, what appears is a very interesting symmetry. You see, uh, we have uh, energy momentum conservation which which is defined by t the spin two the spin two uh, operator and it's coupled to graviton and so on in the higher models uh, like m56 uh, you get what is called the w algebra uh, it's the algebra generated not by the spin two but by the spin three operators and uh, it's not really a Lie group, it's some new constructs, new non In the Lie group, you have, or Lie algebra, you have a, a commutator of two operators is the sum of uh, some other operators. In the W algebra, which appears next, uh, it's uh, not, uh, it's, it, there is certain nonlinear expression here, not linear and operators. So it's something completely novel, uh, which mathematicians uh, never encountered before. But it's, by now it's uh, well investigated and it's 
quite interesting. So, but we will not go into that. That uh, will take us too far. Um, it's just I, I just wanted you to demonstrate to you how uh, how those symmetries they are not imposed on the construction that they appear from the construction. And I, 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 I think that maybe there will be some, there are some indications in higher dimensions that uh, similar things will be happening. For example, with that, that's, I'm referring to the ADS CFT, which we will be discussed in this course, uh, and to the super, maximal supersymmetric Young Mills theory. There are indications of uh, what is called total and in complete integrability there, and that's uh, related to all these miracles. Okay, but uh, by now we have to go further. And, uh, as you can see, this structure is very rich, and you can actually continue exploring it, and people did explore it for many years. And now lots of things are known. I just scratched the surface of, uh, of all these things. Um, but we will go now to, the, to what happens to all this uh, stuff when you couple it to gravity. And that's important uh, for us because uh, it, it's a good, first, in the first place, it's a good theoretical laboratory for uh, learning gravity. Mm. It, it teaches a lot of lessons about gravity. Um, and secondly, uh, it may have also some uh, practical interest uh, for, the, for string theory and for uh, some, other, uh, some other things. Anyway, uh, let's uh, generally discuss what happens um, when we Let's discuss how to couple things to gravity. Uh, the, one of the main reasons why, I'm, uh, why we will be studying this model is that in this model it seems that uh, gravity not complicates things but simplifies things. Um, although we still don't have for quantum gravity in higher dimensions. So generally, let me remind you that uh, generally we mm, have, when we have some many body system and we, c we have some conserved quantities, we couple it to gauge fields. For example, you can imagine that uh, you have uh, uh, some, di let's suppose we have some condensed matter example, some dielectric coupled to electromagnetic field, or vacuum. Let's start with the vacuum coupled to electromagnetic field. We know that uh, the reaction of the vacuum to electromagnetic field is uh, described by, by the so-called polarization operator, uh, which is defined uh, in the following way, you say that uh, we impose uh, some external electromagnetic field delta I A alpha on the, onto the system and it causes the current. So we have the current uh, which is um, generally speaking in the linear approximation is defined by this thing. And this uh, polarization operator itself is the correlation function. It's related to the correlation function of two currents. And uh, we understand that in order to describe propagation of electromagnetic field in this medium, you have to modify the Maxwell equations. You have to take into account that this induced current uh, is there. 
So let me, uh, it's just uh, some general, generalities uh, which I want to Uh, so the property, uh, in fact, in, um, in the vacuum, polarization operator is expressed, it's a tensor, but it exp it's expressed in terms of one function. Uh, you can always write it down as pi of q square, delta alpha beta minus, I, I shall introduce the useful tensor, delta alpha beta perpendicular, the projector onto the plane orthogonal to Q. Mm. And uh, this pi of Q square, if the theory doesn't have long-range uh, masses particles except for the photon, it's uh, constant multiplied by q square as q goes to zero. Um, that actually uh, is something you know very well. It's just the fact that the photon has zero mass. That the mass of the photon coming from this operator, uh, it, um, it's not, uh, it, it remains zero after immunization. Although, if you naively calculate, once again, if you naively calculate this loop in QED, you get D4K and you have K, Q minus K. It's quadratically divergent, uh, but um, gauge invariance, uh, if you uh, uh, it's quadratically divergent, and uh, it's clear that it contradicts gauge invariance, that gauge invariance should set it to zero. But uh, let's uh, discuss for one second, it will be important for us later, let's understand why the cutoff, this is obtained by the cutoff when you said that momentum is less than lambda. Why this cutoff? breaks gauge invariance. It's obviously break gauge invariance. If you calculate, it will not cancel. You see, in QED, this loop is not canceled by itself. If you simply cut off all possible momenta, uh, you, will, you will get the quadratic, quadratically divergent mass of the photon. So what is the, how, how would you explain that, why and what would be the right way to regularize it in a gauge invariant way? The answer is not to be dimensional regularization. Yes, uh, but uh, it's not the answer to my first question. And the first question is uh, why this uh, naive uh, cutoff in momenta uh, breaks down gauge invariance? What goes wrong? Do a general gauge transformation with probe, not necessarily probe all momenta, not? Well, sort of. Uh, uh, but you can also say that um, the covariant quantity is not the momentum itself, but the momentum minus uh, vector potential. This is the gauge invariant momentum. Cut off the yes, so you have to cut off it this way. If you don't, uh, and in this way you can uh, elaborate it and it will be indeed gauge invariant and will give us, uh, um, will, will give us zero photon mass. But important lesson which, which we will be repeating many times uh, uh, is that uh, the cutoff for K is field dependent. Uh, it's some very strange uh, thing, but uh, it is field dependent. And um, 
so, uh, and, and we have to get used to it. Um, in the same way, in gravity, it will be also field dependent, depending on metric and so on, the cutoff. The cutoff in gauge systems is a tr very tricky thing. Or you can actually uh, get the same uh, correct result uh, if you look at the lattice on which uh, gauge invariance is explicit. Uh, you, can you can introduce the lattice electrodynamics with explicit, uh, explicit gauge invariance. Then the photon mass will be zero. Okay, uh, now one more thing, uh, which is, uh, oh, we're well, getting late. Um, Uh, the one more thing. This the, there was it was one function which determined that will be the last uh, one function which determines uh, the polarization operator. If we are in the medium, how many functions? Uh, if we are in dialectic, how many functions who, instead of this one we will have? Two, which are what? How they are called in? In dielectric polarization. Exactly. Uh, uh, ex ex exactly. It's a dielectric constant and magnetic uh, permeability, and. Uh, the, that uh, and uh, what, what makes them one in the vacuum? That would be the last, really last question. Lorentzian. Huh? Lorentzian. Yeah, but I'm, uh, I, I mean something even more uh, trivial. In um, is, they, they define the speed of light. The speed of light should be one. That that's why they there is only one function in. Uh, in the vacuum and two functions in the medium, which uh, in which speed of light may be variable. Okay, let's stop here. We're getting too late, um, and uh, the next time we will uh, work out the formulas. These formulas for gravity and see what happens. Something remarkable happens to these minimal models when they are coupled to gravity. Let's stop. <clears throat>